It's a truly, truly a great honor, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you, formally now, Ambassador Kenneth D. Taylor, who risked, as you've heard, his personal safety, the safety of his family, as well as the integrity of his country for our government, for our citizens. For three months during the, the Iranian hostage crisis, Ambassador Taylor, as you've heard, and his family provided shelter for our fellow Americans until they were able to escape with his assistance. Ambassador Taylor has had a long and distinguished career in the Canadian Foreign Service. He entered the Foreign Service of his country in 1959 and has served in various diplomatic posts in various capacities in the countries of Guatemala, Pakistan, the United Kingdom, here in the United States, and of course in Iran from 1977 until 1980. Ambassador Taylor is an officer of the Order of Canada, has received the, international, the Haas International Award, the Canadian Club Gold Medal, the Medal of Merit from California, and from this country, the Congressional Gold Medal for conspicuous public service. That is the highest award given our government to any citizen of a foreign country. Ambassador Taylor's concern for the welfare of the six citizens of our country against tremendous odds personifies the humanitarian spirit that the Harry S. Truman Good Neighbor Foundation has become to recognize and to honor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present the following award to Kenneth Taylor. The Harry S. Truman Good Neighbor Award Foundation presented to Kenneth D. Taylor, May 8, 1985. And I quote, our good friend and neighbor whose friendship and devotion as a humanitarian went far beyond the call of duty. As the Canadian ambassador to Iran, he sheltered and saved the lives of six United States citizens at the risk of his life, his family, and the honor and prestige of his government. The Harry S. Truman Good Neighbor Award Foundation uh, presents this to our good friend, our good neighbor, Ken Taylor. Mr. Ambassador, God bless you. Nice to have you here. Well, Mr. Talge, Distinguished Head Table, Ambassador Gottlieb, Langham, friends, citizens of Kansas City. It's a great delight for myself, Pat, Douglas, to join here with you today. And it's particularly a pleasure to meet Henry Talge after speaking to him over the phone for many months. One does not rest after a telephone call from Henry Talge. <laughs> His warmth, his genuine spirit, and all those wonderful traits which are so typical of Missouri reflect themselves over the telephone, let alone even more so in person. <laughs> Particularly honored to join Colonel Fritz, Lieutenant Colonel Bridger, whose devotion not only to country and duty was recognized today. Bruce, Mark, and Bob, graduates from the Tehran School of Unorthodox Diplomacy. <laughs> it's always good to see you in a more conventional setting than Tehran. Alan, your very kind words, very thoughtful words, I think give an indication that the successful departure, successful departure of citizens who arrived with U.S. passports and left with another country's passports is that that endeavor was not an individual effort. It was collectively done in Tehran, where particularly John and Zena Sheardown offered a home to Mark, his family, and Bob, to the good guidance and direction from Ottawa, which we benefited from, and then also the commitment of U.S. State Department officers members of the administration, the CIA, in Washington, who all contributed towards what 
in the annals of diplomacy will probably be viewed with some perplexity. All of us are aware that Canadians highly admire the accomplishments of President Truman. And accordingly, as a Canadian, a great deal of honor with a sense of privilege that I accept the Good Neighbor Award. Indeed, the Good Neighbor Award designation gives an indication and illustration of the special bonds that we've talked about earlier today, the unique bonds between Canada and the United States. These bonds were created by not only citizens, such as ourselves, but also statesmen, and one who did make a personal, positive, and long-lasting contribution was, of course, President Harry Truman. When during those difficult post-war years, 1945 to 53, gave renewed confidence to North America and made the Canadian-U.S. relationship one that exemplified trust and tolerance. You may remember that Harry Truman wrote a letter to his future wife, Bess, saying that he called himself, quote, a kind of good-for-nothing American farmer. He said, I always had a sticking notion that one day maybe I'd amount to something. He said and then added, but I doubt it now, like everything. And this is the man who 35 years later changed the basic nature and direction of U.S. foreign policy to this day. He introduced not only an outward-looking country, but he was the architect, along with some others, of NATO, the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, and lastly, of course, the decision to take U.S. troops to Korea. Yet, the nature of the man was such that he kept everything in perspective. He recalled in 1946, after an evening of relaxation, he said at that point, I played a little five cent poker and settled the affairs of the world generally. Even though he was known, well known and recognized as a senator from 1935 to 1945, Canadians knew very little about President Truman when he assumed the office of president in April 1945. Harry Truman, on the other hand, had had very little contact with Canada, very little experience. Lester Pearson, one of Allen's predecessors as ambassador in Washington, was in that position at the time that Franklin Roosevelt died. He later became prime minister but at that time, Prime Minister Mackenzie King of Canada was a close friend of FDR, and Lester Pearson was an admirer. It was difficult for King and Pearson to become immediately acquainted with the new president. Those were busy days, and they hadn't had the opportunity before that, given slightly different interests on domestic and international scene. And in a radio broadcast, just after FDR's death, Lester Pearson said that he belonged to us all. So it was rather a modest start for a new president and a country, Canada, that he'd had relatively little experience with to that date. But Canadian athletes, Canadian attitudes toward President Truman changed rapidly. Pearson later remarked in his memoirs how quickly he acquired a respect for the president. And on reflection, he said that he was decisive without being rash, that he was courageous without being foolhardy. The years that Harry Truman was president of the United States were perplexing and difficult years for Canada. The consequences of the changes that World War II left were not understood yet in Canada. We weren't certain whether or not to return to an isolated, somewhat more isolated tradition, or be somewhat bolder in a new and threatening world. Remember that Canada and the United States were probably only two of the major nations who were not bombed during the year, during the war. But in terms of resources, size, 
our influence was fairly modest in relation to that of the United States. Nonetheless, we did offer with the United States, particularly working closely with President Truman, first a system, an international trading unit, multilateral, and to eventual benefit to all. Next came the critical winter of 1947-48, when economic recovery in Western Europe was faced with a new urgency. In March 1948, Czechoslovakia was taken over by the Soviet Union, an event which sustained or precipitated a great degree of pearl, peril almost in Washington as Pearl Harbor, and it precipitated rearmament almost immediately. Upon coming to terms with that emerging conflict, the realities is in 1948, Prime Minister Attlee, Prime Minister Mackenzie King, and President Truman met for the first time to discuss an Atlantic alliance. It was argued at that time that the Atlantic alliance should not be merely for defense purposes, but it should be much broader in scope, and it shouldn't be seen as an alliance merely for mutual protection, but something that would add and encompass economic and social objectives as well. When agreement was reached, despite some debate, it illustrated three aspects of Canadian-U.S. relations. That is, that although our objectives were the same, our approach is frequently very different. That although we did differ immediately, we didn't differ as adversaries, but as friends and allies. And finally, that when we did reach an agreement, the relationship after the debate was stronger than it had before, had been before. As well, the three statesmen, Attlee, Mackenzie King, President Truman, discussed the matter of seeking or pursuing atoms for peace. This again was looked at from various perspectives and resulted in the creation of the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. And many of the points made by President Truman and the other two colleagues are embodied still today as a cornerstone of Canadian policy. We all remember, many of us, Saturday, January 24th on 1950, when President Truman received at home in Independence a call from Secretary of State Dean Acheson. He said, Mr. President, I have very serious news. North Korea has invaded South Korea. The invasion by communist forces from the North was one of President Truman's, not to overstate it at all, greatest challenges. The president viewed the attack as a challenge by imperialistic communism. And he remarked upon retirement in 1953 that I have hardly had a day in office that has not been dominated by this all-embracing struggle. In the House of Commons in Ottawa, Mr. Pearson again remarked that I am sure that the members of the House will applaud and support that is the action of President Truman, this act of high courage and statesmanship on the part of the government of the United States. One week later, five countries had committed naval forces to that end. Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Canada, to be joined by others. In view of increasing tensions mentioned in the post-war era, it's not surprising that most of the remarks that I've made have been associated with conflict, potential warfare, but that I'm happy to say as well that there were some domestic issues of a more peaceful nature which were resolved through the cooperation of the two heads of state. In this instance, it was the St. Lawrence Seaway. Louis Saint Laurent was Prime Minister of Canada at that time, Prime Minister 
replacing Prime Minister Mackenzie King, Canadians had become impatient. Although each administration since 1932, plus a treaty, had signified joint development of the St. Lawrence Seaway, the United States Congress had resisted such an initiative. Prime Minister Lau Saint Laurent came to Washington in 1951 and said to President Truman that he could no longer sustain the force of Canadian public opinion and political will and we would likely go alone with the St. Lawrence Seaway. President Truman used this opportunity again to attempt to convince U.S. members of the Senate, Congress, opposing opposition, whether it be private or public, that we should unite with Canada and make, for instance, Duluth and Toronto an inland port. And this time, he succeeded. But these achievements, we look back, to a large extent, the responsibility and seen through the encouragement of President Truman wouldn't happen without a warmth or a personal feeling developed with his counterpart, head of state. And to that end is President Truman visited Ottawa in 1947. His welcome by Canadians was warm, it was overwhelming, and he didn't forget it. At one point during the rather hectic schedule, they stopped for refreshments. President Truman asked for bourbon and branch water. When it was reported that there was no branch water, he said not to worry, he had brought his own. <laughs> Missouri self-sufficiency is a very laudable characteristic. The examples of cooperation in defense, economic matters during President Truman's time underline the bonds which both President Reagan, Prime Minister Moroni spoke about, Alan Gottlieb, Bruce Langham, and that it clearly underlines the nature and the special relationship that we both, both enjoy. Our current leaders, Prime Minister Moroni, President Reagan, have to a large degree renewed that spirit that President Truman developed with two Canadian Prime Ministers. A spirit of warmth, a spirit of friendship, but also a spirit of mutual understanding. It's a relationship that tolerates, in fact encourages, legitimate differences, but essentially feels confident in a good resolution. In the presidential suite, on the top floor of the hotel, which is remarkable room which all presidents since Teddy Roosevelt have visited. In fact, I imagine have slept there. There's a photograph, a painting by Greta Kempton over the mantelpiece, over the fireplace. And I have looked, it's, it was done in 1947 of the president, and underneath, by coincidence, there's a quotation that it said, we seek a peaceful world, a world of good neighbors, living in terms of equality and mutual respect. And that, of course, was an address that he made during his visit to Ottawa. All of us here, in fact, citizens everywhere, have the lasting benefit of President Truman's ideals and his dedication. It helped shape our nation in those difficult post-war years and it helped shape the entire international relationship of all countries, as we can see behind us, in particular, the United Nations. On returning home in 1953 from Washington, the Trumans were greeted by a crowd of 5,000 on Delaware Street. He wrote in his diary the next day that Mrs. Truman and I were overcome. He said, yet it was the payoff for 30 years of hell and hard work. Yet there was another side to remember of President Truman. And that is, in response to a television producer 
who posed in the 60s the question as whether he felt, President Truman, he would be considered by history to have been a great president. President Truman replied that he would not say he was first among presidents, but that he had had great fun trying to be great. Let us today have a great time, look for a greater future, trying to walk in his footsteps. <laughs>